This lecture on, is on Aztec government, stratification, warfare, and imperialism. And basically what we would like to cover would be the basic structure of the Aztec government uh, to highlight how stratified what the class system that they had and the importance of the military as well as the significance of conquering uh, adjacent communities. Let's begin with this image of the tutelary god or tribal leader of the Aztecs. His name is Huitzilopochtli, which literally means hummingbird left. Uh, Huitzilopochtli is the in Nahuatl, a name in Nahuatl, the lingua franca of the Aztecs. And this god told them uh, during their migrations that they should continue wandering until they came upon a very specific vision, which would mark the place where they were to establish a nation. And that place would be marked uh, by this vision of the eagle. And it is depicted in various manuscripts. This one happens to be from the early colonial codex Mendoza. So let's look a little bit more closely to the frontispiece. The very first page of this manuscript has this image, and the page is divided into roughly two registers. So let's look at the top one. So here's the image that I was talking about. The Wichilopotli said, you will come upon a vision in which you will see a prickly pear cactus, nopal in Spanish in Mexico, growing out of a stone and on that cactus would be an eagle perched, an eagle would be perched on this cactus. Usually, this vision or these depictions have also a serpent on the eagle's beak. Here, uh, that's not the case. Now, below that image is an emblem of warrior or warfare of conquest, which uh, consists of a shield and a a set of arrows, and that's a glyph or an emblem for, uh, for a warrior or warfare. Now, also the upper register around it is, uh, has these lines and these diagonal lines that divide the upper portion of this page into four quadrants. And the quadrants have various men sitting in the position that men are usually depicted as sitting like that. And these men have to be, happen to be sitting in reed mats that are emblems of um, leadership, of like that they are uh, the kings or, or leaders. And they happen to be the weight Latoani, and I'll talk a little bit about it in the next couple of slides. Uh, but they are uh, the various founders that uh, since 1325, until 1521, the Aztecs have had. And one of the most salient ones is this uh, particular Wade Latoani because he's got, a, he's, he's got face painting. There is a glyph for speech, which gives the name of uh, Wade Latoani, uh, the great speaker or a great orator. And he is shown as speaking, which signifies he's a leader. And there is blood on the side because leaders often would pierce and bloodlet. And this blood, I'll talk a little bit about the significance of it, but that was associated with the Wade Latoani. In addition, another interesting thing to, to look at would be all of these glyphs, which are calendar glyphs. And one of them is tied with a rope, which signifies filial ties to the Aztecs. And to read would be the first year of a very important cycle of time for them, which would be the 52-year cycle, which I covered in another lecture. And so uh, this glyph would signify that uh, they are a lighting, a new fire, and that is a little bit of a promise and a symbol that unites them as a people, but also that when one cycle ends, another one begins. So let's uh, uh, look over at the word Tenochtitlan, which is the Aztec capital. And 
where that vision was, that's where they established their capital city. That capital city happens to be modern-day Mexico City, and it's Tenochtitlan, composed of these three Nahuatl words. It's Tetl, which means stone, Nochtli, the cactus, and Tlan is a suffix for place. And so there you have it, Tenochtitlan. I also included two columns here. On the left would be a list of the weights Latawani. Uh, and I begin with Tenoch, which uh, some scholars think that was not necessarily a real person, uh, but they included it in the list. So I included it in the list. So maybe the so maybe Akamapishli would be the first weight Latawani. And on the right, I include a list of Suwakoato, which literally means woman snake, which is an office. This would be equivalent of, let's say, uh, vice president or second in command, someone helping the king. And the very first one we have is Tlacaelil under the Weislatuani's rule, uh, whose name was Itzcoatl. And this Lakayalil actually is the person who made under Iscoatl the Aztecs imperial. And he served under all of these weights, Latuani, these four on the list. So I included various other Tlatoani. I included Motekusoma, Yokoyotsin. So it's Moctezuma the second. Moctezuma is sort of uh, a Spanish version of Motecuzoma, which is the classical Nahuatl. So you can notice, you, you will notice that there are two with this name. And so uh, the second one is the one that the conquistador Hernán Cortés met in 1520. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the next lecture. And as you can see, the Aztecs did not uh, die out or they didn't continue electing Weitz Latawani, but it continued and I give you a much longer list of the Weitz Latawani that they had. So Aztec society was very stratified. At the very top of this society, the one who held the most power, land, in any other property, for example, the tribute from the adjacent communities that they had conquered uh, would be held by one person, the Wei Satawani, which I said was the great speaker. And this title would be the equivalent of an emperor because his place, uh, his palace, uh, the Tekpan, it was the very center of administrative, judicial, and military matters. So very important. In a minute, I'll show you the layout of the Templo Mayor, and we'll look at that. So below the Wei Slatuani, the main organizational units will be the Altepetl, with Tenochtitlan being an Altepetl, and that literally means water mountain. And that would be a little bit like a city-state that was headed by a Tlatoani, Right, not the Wei Tlatoani, Wei meaning great, but a Tlatoani. So that would be the Altepetl. And then uh, the Altepetl will be divided into Kalpuli, which, be, which would be smaller communities, right? Small communities or land holding corporation, because the Kalpuli would own the land communally um, as a corporation, like I said, and it would, uh, the group would be formed by families related by kin, and they would be headed by another leader. So then that would be below the Tlatoani, and that would be the Kalpolek. And these Kalpuli were smaller communities that were together to make rules and govern their own uh, community. So they were independent, that they had a lot of freedom in uh, figuring out how they would uh, rule themselves. And just to give you an idea, there were about 80 Kalpuli in Tenochtitlan in the 1520s. So the other aspect of social stratification would be that 
So here I write again the Wei Satuani, the emperor, the main leader, right? And there were two main classes of people. There would be some that were the Pili, the singular, or the Pipiltin, the plural, would be the noble class, the upper class. And that would include the nobles who were related to the Wei Satuani. And by the way, all the Wei Satuani would be of this royal line. It doesn't necessarily mean that their sons would inherit the throne. In fact, it would be through brothers or through election, and they elected the one who was um, most politically savvy or uh, um, who would they thought that would be a great way to Giovanni. And anyway, so in, the, in this class of Pipiltin would include nobility, priests, class, the military, particularly uh, those of the high-ranking military, merchants, or long-distance traders called Pochteca, and various professionals, including scribes, sculptors, Amanteca were very much, uh, uh, they were very much uh, given a lot of uh, things by the Wei Satuani because uh, they, they really uh, valued the work that the Amanteca, which uh, they produced very beautiful feather works. And then, uh, so these are the type of people that would be under the Pipiltin, the under this upper class. And then below that would be the vast majority would be Masewaltin or the Masewali for singular, and that would be the commoners. And usually in summary, it would be that the elite or the Pipiltin provide, would provide the land. Uh, they would help with the government to govern everything and make sure everything was running smoothly, I suppose. Uh, even um, adjudicating cases in court, for example. And then you would have the Masewaltin in that class provided labor and most of the tribute. There was another class, and it's actually not that large, by the way. People think that there's a large majority. It, it had nothing to do with the type of slavery that existed in the U.S., what is today the U.S. Uh, in the South, uh, the system of slavery there that was abolished in 1865, is not necessarily what the Aztecs had. Uh, the Mayeke were serfs or slaves, and some people actually did sell themselves into slavery when uh, things went terrible or there was a famine or something like that, or um, they were you know, prisoners of war and various things. But that accounted to about less than 5%, or maybe 2% of the population, according to some records. So I want to review a little bit about who this Wei Tlatuani was, who was the, upon whose person all this power and wealth uh, congregated, concentrated. Okay, So here we have this particular uh, plaque is called a dedication stone, the dedication stone. And in the lower register, you have a, a glyph for eight reed, and at the top for seven reed. And those are two different, um, it, it's um, commemorating two very specific. Uh, so this plaque is so interesting on so many levels because it references, it evokes so many themes. For example, just the year alone, seven read refers to 1486, when Awisoto, this Wei Satuani, would have ascended to the throne, would have been elected and, and therefore ascended to the throne. And eight read would be 1487, and maybe that's when the temple was um, dedicated or this plaque was made. And by the way, every time a new Wei Slatawani came to power, one of the things that they would do is enlarge, beautify the Temple Mayor, which was built at the site of this uh, image that, that we began the lecture with. And... 
it's interesting. Over here, you can see the line drawing of here, which is a little bit easier to read. And then on the other side, you see his predecessor, Tisok. And you know that by the glyphs uh, above their heads, that is their name, and these are their kings. And what they're doing here is they're piercing their ears with my gay spines, which you see them here also in the center of the picture. And they are um, piercing their ears and bloodletting, right? So they are giving of themselves all this blood that is going to this glyph that signifies the earth. And these bloodletting rites were very important. It's auto sacrifice that uh, linked this wage tatuani to, uh, it, it, it actually signifies that their rule is uh, sanctioned by the gods, that they, this associates them with the gods, and they are, they, this helps to legitimize their rulership. The other thing that happens is that the dress that the both uh, Wage Tatuani are wearing, it's more fitting of priests uh, with the uh, pouch over here and uh, a very simple dress as opposed to the more elaborate royal mantle because during a, um, an enthronement of a king, uh, this Wage Tatuani would be wearing a royal mantle the best jewelry, obviously a crown as well. But over here, they are shown more like a priestly class because they are engaged in this self-sacrificial action of bloodletting, in this case, from their ears. So the other thing that, that makes this image very interesting is the fact that uh, we saw told at these dates, that are so significant to his own rulership, he's depicted with Tisok, his predecessors, and he happens to be the brother as well, their brothers. And both sets of imagery, the fact that they're involved in this ritual and the fact that um, the previous Wake Satoani is depicted as well, it's uh, showing that he's a legitimate king. He's the legitimate emperor the way Shatawani. And then the other thing I want to show you is that some of the paraphernalia or some of the items that a way Shatawani would wear. And for example, he would, he would wear this crown that is a blue tur turquoise crown. Uh, she was holy. And he would be wearing this very beautiful blue tight cape. And he would be sitting in a throne these, in these, in, for the Aztecs. It would be a reed, uh, a seat made out of reeds. And that is almost like a glyph of, uh, of a waste Latuani. The other thing is that the waste Latuani lived in the most sacred precincts of, for the Aztecs. For example, in this image from the early colonial Primeros Memoriales, uh, you see here is the depiction of the Templo Mayor, the Way Teocali. Uh, it's in, it's one of the largest buildings in this precinct. And you see over here is a shrine to Tlaloc, the god of rain. And to the other side is a shrine to um, Huitzilopochtli. And in this center was surrounded by walls and it also had causeways, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It also had various temples for different gods, and it had mm, the Tsompantli, which is not... Uh, the, it had a couple of Tsompantli, which is a skull rack where they hang uh, sacrificial victims or skulls of people who had, uh, had been sacrificed. Um, there were quarters for the priests around here, and also this uh, glyph, that resembles the letter I in our alphabet, it is a ball court where they played a ball game, which I will cover in a, in a separate lecture. And the outside of these walls would, ha uh, would be built, they, they had built 
several other structures, many of them would be palaces and gardens where the Wei Tlatuani lived. And an interesting thing about this, uh, the, this nation that was evolving was the development of alliances with other cities. And uh, I should go over the Triple Alliance, which consisted of Tenochtitlan, the center of power, was Aztec, and they're known as, uh, the Aztecs are also known as Tenochka because of, if you belong, if you are from Tenochtitlan, Nahuas because of the um, language, or Mexica, which is what they would be known once they established the city. Uh, so all of those names for Tenochtitlan, and Tenochtitlan had uh, shared power and they, when they collected the tribute for all the communities that they had conquered, they would go to, they would distribute it among Tenochtitlan with getting the largest portion. And Texcoco and Tlacopan receiving um, a good share of that, of that tribute. Texcoco was, uh, the people from Texcoco, by the way, is, are known as Alcohuaque, and that Tlacopan, or modern-day Tacuba, uh, the Tepaneca. And I wrote that here so that you don't get confused from the readings about, the, sometimes they use, uh, they interchange in the literature, uh, these names. So I decided to put these names here so that you don't get confused about what we're talking about. Now, some scholars think that the Triple Alliance was a construction from the colonial period. But there is evidence, uh, beginning with Cortes, who was actually very interested in really understanding how the government works so that he could take advantage and, and, and understand and deal with them. So he is the one who talked about the Triple Alliance, and there's various other sources speaking about it. But there's been arguments made by scholars that talk about other cities being as important and things like that. But for now, um, understand that when scholars are talking about a triple alliance, they're talking about Tenochtitlan being the most important or most powerful one, and Texcoco being the second most important city for the Nahuas or for the Aztecs uh, at this particular time in the 16th century. And Tlacopan was not as important as, the, uh, as other towns, but uh, this is part of the triple alliance that we're talking about in the colonial period. And it appears that they actually had uh, such alliances with other cities before that. And here's a map that I included showing the extension in highlighted area. This tan area is showing the Aztec Empire, which went from Tenochtitlan all the way down to what is now Central America. And it actually extended much farther. Some sources say that as far as Nicaragua, Nahuatl was spoken. It just shows how extensive their a power in their uh, cultural culture reached in the region. And this is a, uh, a closer view of the lake area. And Tenochtitlan was built really in that little island in Texcoco. And here's the Triple Alliance with, uh, I'm showing you here, this is where Texcoco was, and this is where Tlacopan was. So they're very close. But Texcoco is farther away on the lake and um, Tlacopan on the other side, much a little bit more closer, cl closer, excuse me. So let's go over a little bit about the warfare now, which was a really important aspect of their society because through warfare, they would go to, they would conquer communities who would eventually become tributary uh, places. And that was important because um, there were so much specialization sometimes in, in, in the area that it was important for the Aztecs to remain powerful, to demand tribute and collect it. And, and that's how they would, uh, the king, the way Satuani would be able to uh, enlarge the shrines and, and actually also commission new artworks to be made and it all fed into it all helped everything right if 
you engaged in warfare, you would be able to collect more tribute. And that in turn will help you to become wealthier and show the wealth by all, the, by all these uh, additions that you would make to temples and construction. And the art will also help to showcase the power of the Aztecs. And the warfares, uh, through warfare, they would have, they would. So important was where warfare that each altipetal or city state would have institutions, uh, sc schools that would be, for example, that Calmeca, uh, which were places that where priests and artists also trained, or Telpochcali where warriors trained. And if you were from uh, Amasewali, you could actually go up in the ranks if you gained distinction in warfare. It was very difficult. So you had to be a very um, gifted warrior. And th so there was some, uh, some uh, chance of social mobility. For, but for the most part, it, there was a very rigid system. And because, uh, for example, the, the Amanteca, it, it went via kin. Your next of kin would be the ones who would be training at this Kalmeka for two or their own schools to continue this tradition of uh, artistic tradition. So people from the outside couldn't join that necessarily very easily. So that's just by way of showing you how rigid their system uh, could be. And while all military, ser military service was mandatory, and because in fact, in a previous lecture, I explained how at birth, at least from colonial sources, we know that at birth, uh, if a child was born as a male, he would be given gifts that symbolize Manhood, in their case, would be emblems of a warrior, for example, a shield and arrows or uh, tools. And then if a, child, a baby, a newborn baby was a girl, it was weaving instruments and things on, pertaining to the heart or that stayed in, within the home. So even though military service was akin to boys and to men and everybody had to serve on, on that level, not everyone pursued a military career or gained distinction in the warfare. And the primary path, as I wrote here, to promotion or that distinction was through the taking of captives. And that's where we're going next. And taking of captives was so significant in the quality, the, the most, uh, if, if you're conquering, if you're engaging in war with a, a nearby community, and you capture one of their most, um, one of their one of the, one of their best warriors, you would be you would bring them, and uh, they would become the sacrificial victim, right? And what the warrior capturing uh, this warrior would gain would be prestige, and insignia, for example, better, uh, more beautiful ornaments to wear as part of your garments, and land grants. And so warfare cannot be overemphasized how significant it was for, for the Aztecs uh, for those reasons. And for example, here's just uh, an example, uh, one way in which um, Amasewali could become, could be part of the military and this is where they would, all would begin or usually a supporter, for example, or in these positions that low-ranking low uh, persons would, uh, in this particular case, is low-ranking person who carried bundles or heavy loads during campaigns. That's one of the th places where you begin in this military career, a uh, supporter. But the wealthier you were, the more access you had to um, gain access to the better schools because the school, the, the better the neighborhood, the better schools it had. And also you could uh, hire private tutors, I suppose, to, to train you 
and you can go up the ranks in the military uh, more efficiently or quickly. And here is an image from the Codex Tobar, the early colonial Codex Tobar, and it's showing that the Aztec warrior, which is to your right, has captured a warrior from uh, the people with, with whom they engaged in war, and he happens to be in a platform, uh, the Temalacato. It's a platform with a ring where they attach the warrior. And a little bit about uh, the, the act of human sacrifice. In the previous lecture, I told you that uh, it would be impossible to, for the Aztecs to ritually sacrifice thousands of victims because, um, especially because if, of, the, of the way that often was used, which is, the, and not necessarily was this the only way, but by heart excision, by taking out of the heart. It's very difficult and you require a lot of precision and there's the, the rib cage getting in the way so that would uh, make the process go a lot more slowly. So definitely the early colonial sources definitely exaggerate the extent to which this practice um, existed in Aztec society. Nevertheless, there's very good evidence that it did happen and one of the things that is different, for example, from a, our modern day way of gauging in war is that a lot of times warfare is engaged in like another polity and stays there. Whereas for the Aztecs, in many ways, um, the, when, when they engaged in the sacrificial, in, sacri in, in um, sacrificing a particular warrior, it was not just a killing, but the whole ritual would be very significant because oftentimes the warrior who had captured would um, think of the sacrificial victim as part of himself, as being myself, right? And, and in, the, in the lecture on human sacrifice, I covered all of that. So here what I, I would like to highlight is the fact that the warrior engaged in this act is, as the readings that we had for this lecture, uh, we're talking about this charisma of, uh, that the Aztec warrior would gain from engaging in the combat and also from all the things that came about from the flaying of, of the of the sacrificial victim, for example. And then what we have been talking about from the readings is that in these second feasts that the Aztecs celebrated, Tlacashi Pehualistli, that is when the sacrificial victims were dispatched at this sacred center and uh, their, the skin of these warriors would be saved and then the warrior who had captured the sacrificial victim would wear the skin for at least 20 days. And so these relationships are really important and very complex to understand. But in some ways, yes, there was a victim that was killed, but in many ways it actually sees of a of a killing, of, of this ritual killing, as it, it, it's suffused with so much more significance than just killing a warrior in the, in the field and leaving the body there. They would bring the body to the holiest precinct and then it would showcase the, the valor, the strength of, of the Aztec warrior. And one of the last things that I would like to emphasize here is that Tenochtitlan was built on a lake and especially the causeways, which are um, pathways that connected Tenochtitlan to the mainland, right? And these are not bridges because they're not, 
raised or they're not uh, and they but these were basically roads uh, a causeway and it, and it was a pathway to to go into the other cities often these pathways had bridges so that you could elevate it in case of uh, to make way for a canoe to allow the free passage of canoes or were removed sometimes uh, in case Tenochtitlan would be under threat of warfare. And in this map of Tenochtitlan is a um, so-called uh, map of Cortes. And look at the date. It's, it was uh, made in 1524. It's showing these causeways going out into the city. And, um, and it, here is the, the sacred center in, in, in the middle with all the buildings that I just uh, went over with you. And so in, in summary, this, what I wanted you to take away from the readings and the lecture was that the Aztec government was founded on these ideas of Im imperialism, right? That the way that in most power was concentrated in one person, and that would be the Huitzilatuani, the emperor. However, it was a very specific type of imperialism because the Huitzilatuani allowed others in their own Kalpuli, in their old Altepetl, to rule as they see fit, as long as they, um, as they gave the tribute that was asked by the Huitzilatuani. And so they also had a very rigid class system in which everyone knew their place. And it was, even though there was some uh, chance of, uh, of uh, bettering your lot through hard work and um, talent, it was nevertheless a very rigid class economic system. And like I said, uh, warfare became extremely important and it was compulsory, but not everybody pursued careers in the military. And one of the things that warfare, uh, warfare did for the Wage Latuani is that they would establish certain communities as tribute places and it would help the empire to collect this tribute. And the last thing is that it all ties up into these imperialistic ideals in which uh, the Huitzilatuani or Tenochtitlan, this Altepetl, sought to conquer other lands for tribute. Uh, another word you can think of, way to think of this is taxation. But, none is, but, but again, the, the focus was this tribute, these goods and, goods and services that are coming from other places, these raw materials, these, um, these even sacrificial victims in the form of capture warriors from the other towns uh, that would be used to show the power that the military, uh, the Aztec military had by showing how they had conquered uh, these very um, revere warriors in their places. The most admired warriors would be conquered, taken, and, and brought to Tenochtitlan to be uh, sacrificed at this particular place in a very specific way. And, and therefore, it was to gain uh, renown or to gain tribute, not necessarily to rule them directly. So the other th